This is funding drugs, it's funding gun running, it's smuggling, and, and a lot of other criminal activities. I said, I told him, like, I'm gonna quit the company, I'm gonna go to the FBI. They say the best things in life are free But you can give them to the birds and bees I need money That's what I want That's what I want That's what I want Hi there, I'm Tom Natchu. Welcome to another edition of Fraud Squad TV. You know, fraud isn't something that just impacts a few so-called gullible people. And it's not a nickel and dime kind of crime. It's actually a multi-billion dollar criminal industry and it's growing every day. The individuals that concoct these schemes won't stop at anything to take your money. There's no conscience involved here. Our investigations are clear about that same thing time and time again. So let's start to protect our families, our friends and ourselves. Stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. Most of us are familiar with car insurance fraud. Some people exaggerate the details of a repair claim or destroy their car just to cash in on the insurance. But few of us are actually aware of the millions of dollars lost each year to insurance fraud. This impacts directly on the honest consumer in terms of increased insurance rates. That's right, when it comes down to insurance fraud, we're all victims, we all pay for it. make a distinction in auto theft between um, cars that are stolen and recovered by the police and the cars that are stolen and not recovered by police. What we look at is the recovery rate of these vehicles. When we see that the recovery rate is very low, it's an indication to us that organized crime is the driving factor behind these thefts. Interpol today has 3.3 million stolen vehicle files on, on their system. This amounts to just over nine billion dollars in stolen vehicles leaving North America. This is organized crime, and this is fueling terrorism, and this is, this is, this is funding drugs, it's funding gun running, it's smuggling, and, and a lot of other criminal activities. These are professional, organized thieves are searching particular neighborhoods. They're targeting neighborhoods where you know, high-end vehicles are located, and they're waiting for people to come out in the morning, start their cars, and go inside and let the cars warm up for 10 or 15 minutes. These vehicles are stolen in order. So they, they place a certain order in, into the books, and they're saying they want a, a 2006 BMW, and they get specific on the color, the interior, and the package, and they go out and hunt these vehicles down. So that's their job, to hunt them. And once they do, they do surveillance on the owners, they check the neighbors, they know when the lights are on, lights are off, so, so they, they, they do their homework. You know, the days where the thieves would come and hotwire a car, um, they're more or less long gone. We still see it on older vehicles, for example. You know, a car that's 10 or 15 years old can still be hotwired. However, what we see now is in order for the car to be stolen, the keys have to be stolen. Well, we see a lot of uh, break and enters now because of the high-end vehicles would need special keys and mobilizing systems. So they'll go in and, and search a person's houses for the keys. We're seeing more of that. In the old days, if a thief wanted your car, he smashed the window, hotwired the thing, and then off he went. But the ways in which thieves now steal cars is actually quite sophisticated. According to a recent auto industry publication, new computer software is allowing high-tech thieves to crack security codes of specific vehicles in just about 20 minutes. 
With a single mouse click, the victim's car is unlocked and its engine is started. The thief simply walks over to the car and drives away. The keyless entry system, heralded as one of the ultimate in auto theft security systems, is actually one of the easier systems to crack, as thieves exchange code cracking software the world over. There definitely is a correlation between uh, fraud and vehicle theft. A car that is stolen, um, and if it's a, a car that's ordered to be stolen, um, the thief might be paid $500 for, for stealing the car. He'll turn it over to the person who, who had him steal the car. That person has many options available to him. One is exporting the car. The vehicles are, are taken over by an overseer, placed in, a, in an ocean-going container, either a 20-foot or a 40-foot container, and exported to a foreign country. When the police become very uh, good at picking off the, you know, the containers with stolen vehicles and the, the thieves change their, their operations and they start to sell more cars locally. In order for him to do that, he has to you know, masquerade the identity of the vehicle so that he's showing that the car is not a stolen car. So there's gonna be new VIN numbers placed on the car, vehicle identification numbers. Paperwork will be tendered in order to make it appear to be a legitimate car. So there's definitely fraud involved in that. So how do we protect ourselves from the criminals working in this vast industry? You're buying from a private individual. Find out where that individual lives. Get some identification from them. If they're trying to sell you a stolen car, you, you need to have something to go on and, and to, to give to the police in terms of identity, etc. The police find out that the car that they have bought is stolen, and we show up one morning and take the car away. There's not a lot of recourse for, you know, the buyer of this car to get their money back, you know, unless we have something to work with and we're able to trace the funds or find this individual. But if you're just dealing with somebody you met on the street, it's very difficult for us to find that person if you can't even find him afterwards. So. In terms of the car that you're buying, make sure that you've done a vehicle history check and that you go and have that vehicle inspected physically, either with your own mechanic or at an independent uh, body shop or, or a mechanic shop to make sure that you, what you're buying is what you think you're buying. We're here once again with Craig Hannaford talking about this whole car theft thing, which really hits me in the gut. If a thief wants your car, he's going to get your car. In your opinion, what are the best systems that you know of to prevent? Well, you know, you're right, Tom. There's organized criminal gangs that are out to steal cars. And they're taking those cars, they're shipping them overseas, and, and defrauding all sorts of people. But you can do a few things to uh, prevent that, or at least slow them down. Obviously, one is not to have your uh, keys in your car when you go inside. You may want to use some sort of uh, steering locking device, such as the club, to make it more difficult for these guys to steal your vehicle. What are the steps that you should uh, go through before you contact the insurance company? Well, you got to call your local police right away, because maybe the, the car has just been taken on a joyride and it'll be found a few blocks away. But it could also have been stolen by organized criminals who are taking it to a chop shop or shipping it in a container overseas. you got to get that information to the police. And then, of course, your next calls to your insurance company. Now, this is something that affects virtually all of us, and I know you're worried about it. So hang on a couple of more minutes. Craig's got some more tips on how to prevent your car from being stolen and what to do if it does. We've covered investment fraud before, and we've seen how the fraudster gains confidence of his victim in order to separate them from their money. But what if this confidence is already in place? We'll see this in this story about one of the most revered relationships of trust, that between students and their teacher. Now it's exploited to fund a bogus real estate venture. Take a look at this.
I met Barry Landreth when I was getting my master's in real estate development uh, degree from U back in 2002-2003. 38-year-old Orange County resident Barry Landreth began this fraud by first calling the University of Southern California. Now he conned them into hiring him as a part-time lecturer in their postgraduate real estate program. Little did the college know at the time, they were providing Barry with a platform to swindle their promising graduate students. Greg Simon was one of his students and then one of his employees. Barry portrayed himself as a very successful real estate entrepreneur who had an investment company that focused on doing hotel investment and development deals. Uh, he talked about these just very lucrative, successful projects that he had done. And he essentially was talking to a, a class of new students in the industry, people who didn't really have enough background to know, uh, right, you know right from wrong or black from white. Barry had tracked me down while I was working for a real estate investment bank up in San Francisco. And it offered me a great opportunity to, or it seemed like a great opportunity to come work for him, you know, lucrative compensation, compensation package and working on some very interesting deals and more added responsibility than what I was doing currently. Barry Landreth saw an opportunity in his trusting and faithful students and told them he was providing them with an opportunity to work with him on a new real estate venture he'd started from scratch. Webster Realty Investors, complete with several major deals pending. The employees here in Southern California were told that the main office was in Chicago where Barry had started this company called Webster Realty Investors. And Webster Realty Investors allegedly had 27 employees working in this office in Chicago, mostly back office type people. Uh, and we were really the, the deal people as he was focusing a lot of his efforts here in California, but as well as some other states. So when you are teaching real estate finance and you are in the business of real estate uh, development and you're making all this money, um, that really makes people believe in you. And he would send us out on these just very, you know, kind of like a wild goose chase on uh, things to research, work to do. And it, it, you know, allegedly these, the work we were doing was somehow related to the, these deals which he had lined up for the company. Barry had this ability to kind of calm our fears or our questions when we started you know, telling him, hey, Barry, this just doesn't make sense. But like any good magician, Barry practiced the art of misdirection when his students got too suspicious, when they got too close. He introduced his team to their first closed deal. Now, this was a multi-million dollar development in Chicago that was this close to closing. Barry had raised uh, some equity funds for a deal that was located in Chicago. And it was to buy a couple city blocks to do some high-rise mixed-use development. For instance, on the Chicago property, um, it was going to be bought and then redeveloped and then sold, or bought, developed, and sold. And uh, the actual location of the property was a little vague. It was at property at this certain intersection, you don't know whether it's the northeast corner or the southeast corner, whatever the case may be. Um, and that was actually an addendum, an addendum C to the, pro to the project that was always missing. Uh, he came to the employees and said, hey, we have a little bit of extra money that we need to raise for this deal. We've already got 40 million of it raised, but if the company is going to put the rest of the money in, but if seeing the employees and some of your friends and family want to get in on this, you're absolutely welcome to. It's, we're, we've already got the deal in contract. We just have to add a little more equity to it. It's gonna close within 60 days, and then you're gonna get your money back, plus a very sizable return. If someone tells you up front, I can pay you 30%, and I've done cases where people are told you're gonna get 100% a week, I can say flatly, those types of investments do not exist. There is no such thing. Myself, our friends and family, the, uh, the employees, you know, a lot of people put money into this deal. Not, you know, this is, we're not talking millions upon millions of dollars, but enough to be substantial for a lot of people. He used his position as a USC professor to prey on his students, 
and family members of his students. If you're attending a class taught by a professor in real estate development and he offers you a chance to go in on an investment with him on a real estate development, who wouldn't have trust in a situation like that? And that's the tr it, once they have that trust, they've got your money. The 60 days came and went, money wasn't returned, and Barry started giving us one excuse after the other as to you know, why there was a delay in returning the funds to the investors. First was the accountants had screwed up the, uh, the statements, and then the attorneys had screwed up some of the documents. And, and he was referencing, he was talking about you know, using some of the biggest names of attorneys in Los Angeles. Uh, who were screwing up these documents. Very importantly, you need to look at the specific details of the investment opportunities being provided to you. In this case, that addendum C, which actually gave the property location for Chicago development, was never provided, despite repeated requests for. And, you know, little things like that, you have to put your, you know, put you on notice that, hey, something's not, not right here. I confronted Barry with it, and uh, he completely denied everything. Um, the money had not come back at this point, and I said, I told him, like, I'm going to quit the company. I'm going to go to the FBI. I don't think he believed me, but I knew I had enough documentation uh, to at least get the FBI on the right track, and so I quit. No, it's safe in your pocket. Greg Simon's report to the FBI led to the arrest and conviction of Barry Landreth on three counts of wire fraud. The 38-year-old Orange County resident pled guilty to all three counts and is now in the midst of serving a six-year sentence in federal prison. This was easily the hardest lesson his students have ever learned. Now I, I have a better understanding now of what it means to trust people. You know, I met Barry as a student. He was my, my teacher. You know, I, typically in that kind of a relationship, you know, a student places a lot of trust in their, in their teacher or professor. It's my belief that in the three, I think three or so years that he was teaching there, that his whole game was essentially to con, uh, whether, con people, whether it was the students or the university. Following the trial, Greg and his fellow students were shocked to learn the details of the case, revealing the magnitude of the fraud of which none of them were aware. All these people we've been communicating with on email were Barry himself, who had gone and created alternate email identities and was using those email identities to talk to us through various different characters. We are lucky if we catch the, uh, catch the con artists with maybe 5% of what they took in, which means if you invested $100, you're only gonna get $5 back, maybe, probably less than that. He did, though, take money from the investors and upgraded his lifestyle. He went and bought a special edition Cadillac Escalade. He and his wife were very into uh, horses, and they went and brought, bought some uh, very world-class, I guess, expensive horses with the investor's money. And then he used the rest of the investor's money to pay uh, salaries and so forth to the people who were working for him. So in the cases where employees had invested their own money, we were essentially paying ourselves to work there. We're here once again with Craig Hannaford for a couple of follow-up questions. Now, these young people seem just a tiny bit too eager to jump into this opportunity. What could they have done to show some due diligence? Well, often, and particularly young people, they may get really excited about an investment opportunity. They think they're going to make a lot of mon money on something, and maybe they're not taking the steps necessary. You always, always have to do your due diligence. You have to check to make sure that the investment you're putting your money in actually exists. In 25 years of law enforcement, you've picked up all these uh, telltale signs in advance. What are a couple of telltale signs that these kids might have looked for? Well, I think uh, when people are uh, sketchy on details, they don't want to provide you written information or written documentation. They make promises that they're going to give you documentation and it never arrives. Those are some big warning signs and you want to do a little bit more research. Now, this particular fraudster was a very clever guy. To make sure that you don't get sucked in by something like this, Craig's got just a few more tips.
Hi, I'm Naomi Joy. An incredible 40% of credit card fraud is due to counterfeit cards. Criminals use technology to read the black stripe on the back of legitimate cards so that they can manufacture phony ones. They can even copy the hologram from a real card to make the fake one look genuine. You can help stop them from getting information from legitimate cards by protecting your own credit accounts. Keep an eye on your credit cards and report any loss or theft right away. Sign a new credit card as soon as you've received it, and any time you use your card, watch where it goes and take it back as soon as possible. If you move, make sure you notify the credit card company beforehand so that your statements aren't sent to your old address. Now we've heard how resourceful criminals can be, and we may not be able to stop all of them, but we can make it a lot harder for them to get what they're after. Now Fraud Squad TV takes it to the streets to hear more of your stories. Uh, I went to a gas bar once, tried to uh, put my gas on visa, and the guy swiped it behind the counter and he said, uh, I can't take this. And I kind of looked at him and went, what, I know I have the money, it's, what's the problem? He said, well, they won't accept it. So when I called the bank, they said, yes, um, there was somebody who tried to use your, your card or your, use your number somewhere out in a completely different city from where we were and it didn't match up with other purchases that I had made and the bank caught it. They called me and said, you know, just, just uh, come in and we'll send you a new card in the mail. It was pretty creepy. It was, uh, about a year ago, uh, I got a uh, notice in the mail that I, was, I owed on multiple credit cards uh, a few thousand dollars on different cards that I had never seen before, different gas cards, cards, uh, you know, I'd and just different things. I had no idea what it was from. I mean, I couldn't believe it, but but I guess that's why it's important to just kind of check, periodically check your credit and your state. Because if I had looked, I would have seen open accounts on my, you know, and I, and I would have known, hey, what's, what is this? But I never looked, I never checked, I never think to. And they had the bills set up so it was being paid online, so I never saw anything on paper. Thanks for sharing your stories. By telling us your stories, we just might prevent someone else from falling for the same scam. Now, if you want to learn more about protecting yourself from fraud, or if you have a story to share, visit our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Let's fight fraud together. Well, that's the end of another episode of Fraud Squad TV. If you'd like more information about the stories that you saw on this episode, or you'd like to tell us about a fraud that may have happened to you, please go to our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Remember, we're all in this fighting fraud together.